Anambra State Governor-elect Professor Chukuma Soludo has released a list of 80-member transmission committee to assist his swearing-in on March 17, 2022. In a statement issued by Soludo's media aide Joe Anam Anatome, the list comprises of 80 members with prominent Nigerians who will play diverse roles. He said the committee would raise and liaise with a team set up by the government of Anambra State to ensure a seamless transition from Governor Willie Obiano's administration to a Saludo-led administration from March 17, 2022. The statement confirmed that former Minister of Education Dr. Obi Ezekwesili is the chairman of that committee, while Professor Benedict Orama, Professor Patu Tomi, and Osita Chidoka will play crucial roles in the transition arrangements. Joining us to discuss this is Sidon Adidumba. He is the Anambra State Commissioner for Information and Public Enlightenment. Thank you very much, Mr. Mba, for joining us. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. See, yeah. Great. So. Make sure this <laughs> Let, let's go straight to it. Many are awaiting the swearing in of the governor elect. Of course, many, as, as many who are awaiting, also have great expectations of this government. So it's interesting for this list to um, surface on uh, our national dailies and, of course, on social media. And top on that list, the chairperson is a former minister of, of education uh, in Nigeria. So let's start by looking at the number of people on that list. A lot of people are wondering why an 80-man committee for the transition? Well, each of them is bringing something to the table, something crucial and something fundamental. They are going to go for just a few weeks, and then the committee goes into liquidation. So it will not take long. These are people choosing for their service record. Each of them is development oriented. It's normal to call, refer to our BSM service as the just for my Minister of Education. Yes, she is. But don't forget that she's an accountant and she was vice president of the World Bank. And she was the person who started what we normally call in Nigeria, the due process office, now known as Bureau of Public Procurement, BPP. That shows the commitment of the incoming administration to due process, to transparency, to accountability, and to making an unprecedented become one of the fastest growing economies, not just in Nigeria and Africa, but in the world. Don't forget the ultimate vision of the Sulu administration is to make sure that Anambra becomes, in the next 50 years, a fully developed economy, like South Korea, like Hong Kong, like Singapore, um, like Israel. So the example goes on. There are odds we better believe that this is achievable. Hmm. Interesting. Let's look at some other people who are on that list. We, we see the former MD of Diamond Bank uh, and former governorship aspirant um, in Ambia State, Dr. Alex Oti. It's interesting to see people who are not necessarily from Anambra State making that list, which is also a breath of fresh air. But we also see disruptors like Chidi Odinkalu and the likes of them. And Professor Pato told me who everybody knows is a change agent. But um, I, I would really love to, um, you know, analyze what these people bring to the table and how it would affect the transition committee. Well, uh, one of the first persons you mentioned is Professor Ben. Uh, Mulberry did not tell us who he is. He is currently the managing director of the African Import Exchange Bank based in Egypt. He is a professor of economics, highly, highly accomplished. So the essential thing that each of the major drivers of the change that is about to take place in Anambra State and hopefully the rest of the federation is development-oriented and development focus. And to use that beautiful language, is a disruptor. Soludo himself is a chief disruptor. The revolution he unleashed on the Nigerian financial system and indeed the entire Nigerian economy remains Muhammad opinion, mm -hmm. much less. Nobody has a match that record. Mm. 
Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, Let yeah, yeah. For for so people are yeah, also wanting... yeah, just to use a very common expression. Okay. He is in for what we call creative destruction. Creative destruction. The status quo cannot remain. The status quo brought Nigeria to this level of mass misery. We can continue. If countries and territories like Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, and Israel that have practically no mineral resources could become fully developed within a generation, within 30 years, we in Nigeria can make it. Hmm. Our climate is wonderful. We are endowed by nature, all kinds of mineral resources, and so on and so forth. And even the location of our continent, of the West African region, of our country, makes it imperative that we develop, not in an organic manner, the way the United States, France, the UK, Germany developed. It took them some 200 years to get to this level. We are going to live through that is to say, our development will not be through the natural process. We are in a hurry, and we are just going to make it. Great. I mean, it's interesting that I love the idea that, you know, there's a vision. And, of course, um, he has a precedence or an antecedent of sort. But there's, this, there's just the much that he can do as a governor of a number of states. So, of course, it, it now boils down to, you know, handshakes across the table, across beyond an amber state, being able to um, network with people, to be able to bring whatever vision he has to bear. But is four or maybe eight years enough for him to even be able to begin to scratch the surface? And I'm not in any way trying to be pessimistic. No, no, no. You are, that is what, and the truth is, this is one of the challenges you have in democracy all over the world. Many of these countries and territories have developed very rapidly. That is to say, within 30 years, ironically, have been developed by dictatorships and quasi dictatorships. Take South Korea. The process of development began with the Pact, who came to power in 1961 via a military coup. And the following year, launched the fourth development plan that resulted in the rapid rise of his country. The other nations, clearly, apart from Israel, we are not developed by democratic governments. So we have this debate going on among scholars throughout the world. Is the leadership the best to ensure the rapidity of development of poor economies? Some say yes, some say no. You can look, if you look at say, Singapore, it's not a dictatorship as such, but it's not. It's what they call an illiberal democracy. Democracy are quite all right, but not liberal democracy. This is a term used by scholars. So, uh, but Israel, but it has a democracy. Malaysia, but it has a democracy. Indonesia was built for many years by soldiers. But it's what we recognize that in a democracy, there are very challenges. If you want to transform, your economy, the way Soledo wants to do. But definitely, he will be there for maybe four years, maybe eight years. He is going to make sure we move in a direction that becomes almost absolutely impossible to reverse. Okay. Once we head in that direction, there's a mass movement that is not going back. And the indicators are strong that Anambra State, more than any other part of the jury, we lead this transformation, transformation and development. Okay, finally, before I let you go, we have just a minute. Um, just as you meant, made mention of the fact that we need to have more and more people who continue, like they always say, we all say that government is a continuum, but we hardly see that because everybody comes with their brand new agenda and, and totally yeah. abandon what their predecessors had put together. What's in the works? I know you're not, you might not necessarily be the right person to answer the question, but I'll ask it anyway. What's in the works to make sure that like-minded governors for Anambra State, which I have said in the past, Anambra has maybe probably done a little bit well in having interesting persons as their governors. But then, of course, to carry on that 
idea and that vision of making Anambra what you want it to be? What's in the works in making sure that they're leaders that are like like-minded, um, always ready to run for that office or somewhat prepared to follow that agenda to the latter in closing? Well, that is why the transition we are seeing now from Governor William Diana to Professor Strugoma Saludu is consequential. It is transformational. Um, Governor William Diana did this on wake up in the morning and he said, I'm going to back Saludu. He reflected on it. Don't forget that as early as December 2019, Governor Saludu set up a committee of talented people, of professionals, all who are members of the Annan Prevention Treaty Summit. The responsibility of this committee is to craft a strategic plan for Anambra's rapid development, okay. for Anambra's emergence as a fully developed economy within 50 years. Okay. So, Soludo is the chairman of this committee. So, it's only logical that the chairman of the committee is now going to be in the driver's seat as okay. governor. Okay. So everything has been planned. By the time Zoludo leaves, another transformational oriented leader will we'll take his place. Will All right. Continue. Now, well, we, we have to go. We have to go. I apologize. Yeah. We're totally out of time. Unfortunately, time waits for no one. Yeah. But I want to say thank you. I, I appreciate your thoughts, your comments. Well, we are rooting for you and your state, hoping uh, that uh, the goals and the plans that you have come to fruition. Sida uh, Ladidumba is the Information Commissioner for Anambra State. Thank you so much for speaking with us. It's a pleasure. All right. Well, thank, thank you all for being part of the conversation. As uh, today is Friday, we will leave you with the highlights of the show this week. In case you missed some, we're going to bring you up to speed. And that's all that we have for you for this week. I'll see you on Monday when Plus Politics returns at 7 p.m. Have a great weekend. I am Mary Anakon. the president 70 percent in the fight against corruption um you see fighting corruption is not a tea party it's a difficult task for anybody in any country of the world no matter how powerful no matter how developed the countries are um corruption can be very tricky uh, when it comes to avoiding the long arm of the law. And uh, you also know that corruption crimes are not committed in the open. And uh, that means that a lot of efforts will have to be put in place to trace the evidence of corruption. Uh, I must tell you that originally and for some time, I've always believed in competency as opposed to zoning. In other words, let's look for somebody who is able to deliver the goods. But in recent times, as a result of so many acts of injustice in the land and a lot of agitation in the land, I'm beginning to think, seriously speaking, that that might appear to be one of the ways to address the tension in the country presently. Let me confess to you that I, while I was the National Legal Advisor of the party and a member of the National Working Committee and the executive council of that party. Uh, the president had always resisted invitation to be domineering in terms of party affairs as much as possible. But as things progresses, you discover that gradually people, in my view, are gradually bringing the all pressure on him to take charge of the party. In other words, submitting the entire party to the president. And I think that led to what happened eventually in dismantling the uh, earlier structure. The reason why we seem to have insecurity all around the country and the reason why they are escalating is because certain persons in government and out of government are benefiting immensely. They, they, these people are the people we call uh, conflict entrepreneurs. They make a lot of cash, a lot of capital out of conflict. So these are the individuals that are actually, uh, you know, you know, stoking up the violence, 
in the South East particularly. And um, what, we, what we said is that it is the duty of the political elites from the South East region because there are quite a number of uh, people in government from that region of the country. They have not really done sufficient, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, they've not really shown sufficient, sufficient commitments. The insecurity you have in the South is basically, as we said, insecurity is being instigated by elements embedded in the federal government. There was no reason for the suspension or the plan to have been imposed in the first place. As I have consistently maintained, it was a decision that was not warranted, it was a decision that was taken in bad faith. So the decision that was taken on account of vengeance in pursuance of vain data by a regime that felt slighted by what was rightfully perceived by a large section of the population as a genocidal and irresponsible tweet by the president was deleted. That, was, that accounted for the so-called ban that the government imposed. So eventually, the government had to reverse the abnormality that they had forced on the country. Those who participated in the atrocities that have been committed against Nigerians, the Dragonian measures, the high handedness the party that is complicit, the political party and the political actors who are complicit in these things that have happened, who have endorsed these things, who have been silent on the impunity of this regime, must be punished in the next election. Nigerians must, and that is the point that I made on, I made on Twitter. I said, look, as citizens, we must imbibe the culture of punishing politicians and political parties that inflict pains on us. The reason why people go into offices and do whatever they like is because of the absence of the policy of consequence. They know nothing will happen. They know they will still be voted for. They will know they will still have people rally for them. So when they do these things that they know that they will pay a heavy price, people become circumspect. People begin to think before they act.